Welcome to Vehicle Dynamics. This show covers safe driving principles you can use to keep you and your passengers safe. And remember, if you cannot do it safely, don't do it. This is just the thing for jumpy nerves. Pizza. Just relax. Look at me. I'm still shaking. I don't know what happened. It's a mistake. You gotta get over it. Just be more careful next time. But I almost rolled the bus. We're gonna sit here, we're gonna have a little pizza, we're gonna watch a little TV, and we're gonna try to forget about it while they check the brakes on the bus, okay? I've never lost control like that. I tried to put on the brakes. It's time to find out how the wonderful world of physical science affects you. It's transit man's world of physical science. Today, we're going to cover five basic physics concepts. Centrifugal force, kinetic energy, inertia, gravity, and coefficient of friction. No, these aren't martial arts movies. They're principles of basic physics that affect vehicle dynamics, particularly if the vehicle you're driving happens to be a large transit bus. Oh, now we're paying attention. Let's look at pictures. The first principle is centrifugal force. Take a look at this vintage piece of musical equipment. It's an earlier version of an iPod. It's called a record turntable. Watch what happens when toy soldiers are placed on the record turntable. <laughs> That's centrifugal force. Well, the exact same thing happens when a transit or paratransit bus takes a curve. You see, centrifugal force makes the bus and the passengers want to move to the outside of the curve. Now, if you're going fast like Speed Racer out there, the centrifugal force pushes the bus even harder towards the outside of the curve. And the tighter the curve, the more centrifugal force there is. I mean, if it had been icy or raining, that bus could have ended up way the heck over here. I don't know how it can be as simple as centrifugal force. Oh my goodness, it's viewer mail time. Let's read this letter. <clears throat> Dear Transit Man, that would be me, I don't understand how your transit bus example could be something as simple as centrifugal force. Please clarify. Signed, Operator Phil. Kind of a weird first name. But you are absolutely and positively right, Operator Phil. It is much more than centrifugal force alone. It's all of those things I talked about at the beginning of the program. Let me explain a bit more about centrifugal force, kinetic energy, inertia, gravity, coefficient of friction. I think you might want to grab another piece of pizza while I clarify the situation. There are five big factors that determine how easy or not so easy it is to maneuver your transit bus. Now, we've already covered centrifugal force. Now, let's talk about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is a combination of weight and speed and motion. So as a 20 to 30,000 pound bus goes through the curve, it's got kinetic energy out the wazoo. And every time you double your speed, you quadruple your kinetic energy. So if a bus is going 30 miles per hour, it's got four times, four times as much kinetic energy as a bus at 15 miles per hour. Factor number two is inertia. Inertia is how much an object resists any change in its motion. Like lawyers to a car wreck, you try and stop them. Now, kinetic energy and inertia go together like hot dogs and mustard. The more kinetic energy a bus has, the more it's going to resist any change in the way it's moving. That's why you skid. Say a bus full of kinetic energy is going down the road. You hit the brake pedal, the inertia kicks in, and you skid. This is because this 30,000 pound transit bus doesn't want to stop just because the wheels did. So when you're going toward a curve in the road, you'll want to turn a lot more than your vehicle does. When you add that to the centrifugal force we talked about earlier, it's a miracle you made it through that turn at all. Of course, you do have some help courtesy of gravity and friction. You see, gravity is the force that keeps the bus down against the road. And friction, why, that's how much traction you have. And friction is a good thing. The more friction you have, the more control you have. Now that means lots of stuff, like 
Tire tread wear and pressure, bus weight and speed, the condition of the road surface, and all of the other factors we've been talking about, they all affect how much friction you have. It's kind of like tag team wrestling. Inertia and kinetic energy are using the centrifugal force against gravity and the coefficient of friction. Of course, you make your turn worse if you use your brake while you're turning. You see, when you do that, you're trying to change directions two times, stopping and turning at the same time, and inertia gets pretty ticked off. And since transit buses are usually really long and kind of top heavy, centrifugal force makes these bad boys want to whip around and just fall over. So play it smart. Break before the curve. You see, that decreases your inertia. In fact, you can then accelerate slightly through the curve. That helps you get your kinetic energy going right with you again. But you know, it ain't enough to know the basics. You also have to understand how all of these concepts of physics fit in with things like acceleration and braking. Consider the game of blackjack. It's a pretty safe bet that all transit operators could stand to learn a few things about acceleration and braking. What? For anyone who missed it, I'll speak slowly. Transit operators can always learn more about acceleration and braking. Who does that guy think he is? I've been driving transit bus a long time. I'm gonna call that station. Let's take a call. Hello, my name is Bill. You're absolutely right. I've been operating a transit bus for years. And I know I need to learn more about acceleration and braking. Can you explain it? Sure thing. Let's try the easy one first. Acceleration. Look, when you start to move, you're attacking the inertia of being stopped. This, of course, resists the new direction causing your transit bus to pitch backwards. You see, that's why everybody ends up at the back end when you take off too fast. What you want to do is accelerate steadily and smoothly, and when you accelerate, pretend there's a raw egg on the gas pedal. Of course, egg acceleration isn't going to help you shoot out into traffic, but it will give you the following advantages. It reduces the risk of running into the vehicle in front of you. Always a good thing. It makes for a more comfortable ride for your passengers, gets better fuel mileage, and it reduces wear and tear on the bus. Now the same is true when you stop. Slow and steady wins the race. Now, where have I heard that before? When you're going to stop, ease off the accelerator early and let the engine slow the bus down. Remember the egg. Give yourself plenty of room to brake. The old four second following distance does pay off. So use a light, even pedal pressure to slow down gradually. This keeps the passengers in their seats, which means they won't be flying up to the front and bothering you. And it gives the people behind you plenty of notice so they won't have to have a bus in their windshield. Smooth start. Smooth stop. Nice and easy. Saves on bus wear and tear. So keep your seat and stay behind the white line. There's a lot more to braking than not breaking eggs. You've also got to understand stopping distance. Let's take a microscopic look. Hmm, normal braking is broken. That's pretty wild, huh? Normal braking is broken down into three parts. Perception distance, reaction distance, and braking distance equals your total stopping distance. Perception distance is how far your bus goes while you recognize a reason to stop. You see a red light, you say to yourself, red means stop. So while you see and think about this, the bus is still going. Now the amount of time this takes is different for each person. Reaction distance is how far the bus travels while you take your foot off the accelerator and put it on the brake. The average time is about three quarters of a second. So what's three quarters of a second? Ah, well, at 20 miles per hour, reaction distance is 22 feet, and at 50 miles per hour, it's about 55 feet. Well, let's see how far you travel while you move your foot. Now, braking distance. Let's see if you can follow this. 
it's equal to the amount of kinetic energy plus inertia as opposed to gravity and friction times pi squared. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a square pi. All we're trying to see is if you can understand that it takes a bus a lot longer to stop than a car does. All right, a bus and a car are going down the road at 30 miles per hour, and this is not a story problem. Anyway, they both hit the brakes at exactly the same time. Now, it takes the car 18 feet to come to a complete stop, but it takes the bus 45 feet. And if the bus is going 60, it's got four times more kinetic energy and inertia trying to keep it from stopping. This time, it takes 180 feet. And that's the best case scenario. Let's say the road is slick with rain, ice, and snow. Then it can take up to three times as long. This means you've got to be especially careful on bridges and overpasses when it's cold. Ice forms on them before it does on the road. And that's what this sign means. Loose gravel, sand spills, etc. they work along the same principle. So you have less traction, friction that is, less traction to compensate for your inertia, so you slide a little bit, it takes longer to stop. Now, that's not the same as skidding. Skidding means that your wheels get tired of fighting against inertia, and one or more of them just gives up and stops sliding. The last hindrance to stopping distance is hydroplaning. Hydroplaning happens when you drive too fast through standing water and your tires sort of skip across the surface of the road like rocks across the pond. Now the best response to all of this is to ease your foot off the accelerator and let the drag of the engine slow you down until you have good traction with the road again. If you start to skid, turn your steering wheel in the direction of the skid so that you're working with your inertia to regain control of the bus. Hard or fast braking causes skidding and it aggregates sliding and hydroplaning. And let's have none of that Arnold Schwarzenegger two foot driving. It causes skidding and lack of control. Trust me when I say to you, hasta la vista, baby. Now, I know that some transit buses in our fleet, especially paratransit buses, have an anti lock braking system also called ABS. Ooh, ah, well, here's the Reader's Digest version. <sighs> Let's see. ABS, yes. ABS senses when one or more of the wheels is going to lock up and prevents it from doing so by releasing pressure over and over again for fractions of a second. Since the brakes don't lock, skidding is reduced and you get more control in hard braking and low traction situations. And here's what else. Your transit bus is ready again. The brakes are fine. And your brake is over? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, well. I don't know about you, but I could use some review. And I know just the man. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're all too kind. Remember, there are five factors that affect how easy or not it is to control your transit or paratransit bus. Kinetic energy and inertia work together to keep you going in the same direction, but they make it hard to change directions and stop. Centrifugal force always pulls you toward the outside of any turn, and since buses are long and top heavy, it makes them want to whip around and fall over. Gravity and friction work together to give you traction. The more traction you have, the more control you have. Always accelerate and brake slowly and smoothly. Speed kills. And remember, it takes you longer to stop in a transit bus than it does in a car. And no two foot driving or I'll be back. Anytime you slide or skid, remember to brake gradually, ease off the brake, and brake gradually again. Turn your steering wheel in the direction of the skid. Stay focused on safe driving. It's the cool way to be. And remember, if you cannot do it safely, don't do it. And uh, oh, transit man, leave a note for the next time. 
no anchovies, okay? Shoo!